In this video, I want to talk about creativity and whether artificial intelligence and machines can actually be creative. And I'm super pleased to be here with Marcus de Satoy. You are an Oxford professor and mathematician. You now hold the Simoni chair in Oxford. That's right, for the public understanding of science. For the public understanding of science. Wow, this is a... Yeah, it's quite a mouthful. Yeah, but... <laughs> So, and you've written an amazing book. I love your book on the creativity code. Um, I have to say, it's probably one of my favourite books that I've re read in the last two years or so. Well, I'm very so, honest. Thank yeah. you. So, I'm really pleased to, to spend some time with you. Um, so, what is creativity? Because when we talk about could AI machines be creative, machines have come, come a long way. Um, I think this is quite a hard term actually to pin down, um, yeah. but I think what uh, many people feel is that um, this thing, creativity, is something unique to us as humans, and that a machine surely couldn't be creative. Um, so I actually quite like a definition that I learned from uh, a cognitive scientist, Margaret Bowden, um, and she's been thinking for some time about the possibility of machines being creative. And, and she defines something as being creative if it's new, surprising, and has some sort of value. Mm. That's interesting because uh, newness, well, machines can often make new things, but they're not particularly interesting. Um, I think it's those two qualities of surprise and value which are, are really important. So, um, and they're actually, uh, you know, rather subjective, surprise, for one person may not be surprised for another value well that changes over periods of history mm. um so it's interesting that uh if a machine is going to be creative it's somehow got to learn what we as a species find uh, surprising and, and what we value and i think what's interesting is surprise is about an emotional response mm. um so actually this creativity is sort of related to our internal emotional worlds. And mm. another definition that I liked, uh, which I used as well throughout the book, was one from the psychologist Carl Rogers, which is uh, creativity is actually our tool to explore our own internal conscious emotional world and to explore the conscious world of another human being and perhaps share with each other different ways of seeing the world. So, um, so I think it's quite a slippery term, but um, but it is one we think is quite connected to being human. So, yeah, that was the kind of launch pad for this new book that I wrote. Very well, good. you know, could, could artificial intelligence be creative? And can it be? Well, I wrote the book because I saw an example of um, a case where a piece of code just did something which I regarded as highly creative. Um, see, in the past, code used to be written in a very top-down manner. Um, a, a, a pro computer programmer would write a piece of code which would tell a machine what to do. If this, then do that. If that, then do this. Um, and so, in some sense, how could the machine ever do something creative? Because it's the human who's telling the machine what to do. Yeah. Anything which comes out the end of the code is, is actually the product of the human who wrote the code. Yeah. But code has changed. So now we're writing code in a very bottom-up manner, where the code is allowed to change, mutate, learn, re itself, um, recode itself. And so it can actually become something quite distinct from the original person who wrote the code that it's kind of uh, started learning mm. from. And so I saw an example where this new sort of code was used to play a game. This is uh, the game of Go, ancient Chinese game, played on a 19 by 19 grid. Uh, players put black and white stones down, uh, the challenge is to try and surround your opponent's territory before they surround yours. Mm. Um, and this was traditionally a game that it was regarded as very hard to write code for. Um, because somehow we played it in a very intuitive, creative way. We didn't really know how we were doing it. But um, a company in London, DeepMind, wrote some code that learnt how to play this game by looking at human examples of the game, then playing artificial versions. And then it challenged the world's best and beat the world's best, Lisa Dole, uh, in a, a five game match. He, uh, the, uh, he only won one game out of those uh, five games. Um, now, we're quite used to computers doing things better than humans, but what was really surprising for me is something that happened in the second uh, game of that match because uh, the code did something really unexpected. It made a move on move 37 of the game 
that traditionally is regarded as a very weak move. It played quite far into the centre of the, the board and I watched these games obsessively on YouTube and I remember the commentators gasping. You know, the surprise of the commentators of how bad a move that seemed to be. And they said, oh, well, Lisa Doll will be able to win the game from this point on. However, um, as the game went on, it turned out that this move made very early on in the game uh, proved to be the move which won that game for the piece of code. Um, so here you see three qualities, a new sort of move, a surprising move because all the commentators gasped, and a move with value because it won AlphaGo that game. And more importantly, that line of code emerged from the learning of the code and it was not written by a human. Mm -hmm. In fact, if a human had seen that line of code, they would have said, oh, that's a bad move. Let's delete that line. So what I think is really exciting is here is a moment where code, through this learning process, has come up with a new way of seeing this game, um, a new way which has surprised us as humans, um, and it's genuinely coming out of the code's learning process not a human writing it in the outset. And so for me, this was the catalyst for this whole book. Well, if code can learn, develop, and take us into new areas and ways of seeing a game, can it actually do new things in other areas and help us to see the world, in, in, hear the world in a new way? In, in the book, you say that this actually triggered some sort of accidental, accident, existential crisis for you as a mathematician, saying actually, if, 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 AI can beat Lisa Doll in, in Go, well, maybe it can do mathematics. Exactly, because I'd always regarded actually mathematics as a very creative subject, which requires choices being made. And I often compared it to the game of Go in the kind of intuitive uh, style that one has to use when you're doing mathematics. Now I saw a piece of code developing an intuition for playing this game. Well, why couldn't it then take the kind of a game that I play, mathematics, and actually uh, learn to take us in new directions. So, yeah, I went through an existential crisis, but I think actually it was a much broader one than just me as a mathematician. It was me as a human mm. going through something existential because um, here was code actually starting to do something that we regarded as quite human. We thought code would just sort of implement what the humans were thinking uh, when they wrote the code. Now this code is starting to to really sort of push the boundaries of, um, uh, of what we're doing as humans. What, what other examples have you seen afterwards that you think actually this is a good example of AI being creative? I think that uh, an interesting one was in music. And it's interesting because one of the very first coders in history, Ada Lovelace, um, she uh, was one of the first to realize you could write lines of instructions to make machines do interesting things. She speculated already, sort of the end of the 19th century, that, well, maybe these machines could actually compose music. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the most interesting examples I saw um, is a jazz improviser um, called the Jazz Continuator. Um, this is an AI uh, jazz improviser that listens to how a jazz musician, uh, in this case, a pianist, Bernard Lubat, French pianist, are his kind of patterns that he creates with his style of improvising. And then by picking up those patterns and uh, which patterns are more important than others, how they get put together, um, the jazz improviser, uh, the AI jazz improviser, was able to, to kind of reply to the human. So that was interesting, but more interesting was um, the human's response to what the AI jazz improviser was doing. Because he said, well, that's amazing. I recognize the world of the AI improviser because it's my world but it's starting to do things I never thought about doing with my sound world. And for me, this is the exciting and very positive side about AI getting involved in creativity. Mm. Because this jazz musician had got very stuck in the way that he was playing. He was sort of repeating particular patterns uh, over and over. Weirdly, I think he'd become more like a machine mm. repeating these patterns. And the AI said, you, you know what, there's so many more interesting things you can do with your sound world. Um, and actually sort of pushed um, this human creator out of their comfort zones, behaving like a machine, mm -hmm. suddenly was able to behave more creatively as a human again. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is the exciting thing, the role of AI as a kind of catalyst mm -hmm. to, to push our own human creativity. 
So is this what you then see as the future? There's augmentation of human creativity by machines that push us further rather than take it from us? Well, I think you've hit on a very important word here, which is augmented. Mm -hmm. um, so AI traditionally was about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, Turing was interested in, in seeing if machines could replicate our own intelligence to help us to understand how the brain works. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we now need to translate AI in a different way. And I think augmented intelligence is a much better translation of those two letters. Um, because we know how to create uh, our own intelligence. Um, we don't do it in the lab, we do it in the bedroom and it's much more fun. Um, you know, uh, so actually what's more interesting is to create uh, an augmented or maybe an alternative, that's another way to translate the A, um, intelligence, something which is different from ours, which then in collaboration with our own intelligence can push both of us further. Mm. And that's what's inter interesting when you come back to something like the game of Go, because it turns out that yeah, the machine can beat the human, um, but human and machine together seems to be more powerful than either the human on its own or the machine on its own. Yeah, we see this in chess, for example. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And we see it more interestingly in something like AI applied to, for example, health. So radiology um, is somewhere where AI is making great inroads, being able to spot patterns in data where there are cancers, where there aren't cancers, and really it's doing an amazing job in visually recognizing um, uh, scans that we need to take account of. But again, still, it's the ra human radiologist together with the artificial intelligence, which is better than both. Um, so for me, this is a project not about uh, competition. You know, are we going to get put out of a job by AI? This is a story of collaboration mm -hmm. about going forward together. So I actually wanted this book to be a much more positive book than most are on uh, the future of AI mm -hmm. and humanity, which is more kind of Terminator, where we're just going to get wiped out and everything's going to be done by machines. Amazing. So what, what do you think this means for, for humans? How do we best prepare for this future? How do we leverage AI? Well, I think one of the really uh, uh, crucial things in, in as we go forward living together with AI is that we understand the AI. The AI is beginning to understand us very well. Um, it can read our emotional world very well, the arts that we create, it's helping us to push that. But I think what we don't understand is how the AI is thinking. So I think some of the most important uh, projects going forward are what are the tools that we can use to help us understand how the code is thinking? And weirdly, this is one of the most interesting stories I saw in the creativity code of art created by AI, which is helping us to understand how the AI code is kind of thinking. So this is Google's recognition software, which is incredibly good. If you give it an image, it will tell you what's in the picture, uh, amazingly powerful. But Google were interested in, well, what really is this code how is it seeing the world? Um, so it decided to reverse the process and said, okay, let's just give it a random load of pixels and ask the code to see, well, what do you see in this randomness? Do you see any sort of patterns emerging? And out of this process appeared these weird psychedelic art pictures, um, not great art, but they gave us a way of understanding how the code had learned. Mm. Lots of images of eyes, animals, machines, but sometimes it picked up bad learning. So there was an interesting case where it got given a sort of grey background and started to see dumbbells appearing inside um, this image. But the dumbbells always had arms attached to them. Um, why? Because the AI had only ever seen images of dumbbells being held by strong men and women. So it thought that a dumbbell was part of the human anatomy. Um, so I think that, um, weirdly, the creativity of the AI may help us to understand the kind of let's call it the subconscious world of that code, how it's actually making its decisions. So just in the same way as we use art to help us examine our, our own consciousnesses as human beings, I think that we can use art in an interesting way to actually examine this kind of mysterious world of code which is beginning to emerge. And for me, it also might help us understand how we function, because we don't understand how we are creative. We don't understand our consciousness. We don't understand lots of 
things that we believe make us human. So very interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think weirdly this book is as much about human creativity, why we create, um, uh, how we create, the sort of things that we enjoy creating, um, uh, as much as it is about AI creativity. Very good. What would you say are your your key takeaways from the book? What would you what would you like a reader to take away from this? I think uh, there are a few takeaways. The first one is that this is about collaboration, not competition, mm. and that we shouldn't see this um, uh, as a huge threat to our creativity. Mm. Uh, some of the best examples in the book are about um, how AI can be used to push our own creativity. Mm. Uh, another one is that we really need to understand code more clearly. So it's not just good enough to uh, have a bit of code which helps you to find your way around the world or recommends books to you because there might be weird biases inside there which we need to snip out. And I think that uh, the book is partly trying to give people a feel for what, what's going on, on under the bonnet. Mm -hmm. um, but also um, uh, to see the limitations of AI at the moment. I think there's a huge amount of AI hype um, so I try to really reveal how quite a few of these stories still have a lot of human involvement. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, we're in this kind of era where in the beginning of the turn of the millennium, everybody, every company put .com on the end of their company name and their stock rise. Mm -hmm. Well, today it's everyone says their company has a bit of AI involved. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to understand what this thing AI is yeah. to be able to really test, well, is this company really about AI or is this just hype? Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Marcus. Pleasure. Fascinating.